welcome. Today we're going to be tying the elk hair caddis. This is a pretty effective pattern uh, all over the U.S., actually effective all over the world for many different species, but especially for trout. Now this is going to be one of the beginning fly tying series for this channel. If you haven't seen one of these before, the pace is purposely slowed down and the steps are a little more thoroughly explained with the intent of being able to help someone who maybe has not tied a fly before, or maybe only tied a few, to be able to tie this pattern. So for the elk hair caddis, we're gonna need a couple of things. We're gonna need some type of hair. Now this isn't elk hair, but uh, is um, deer hair. And that's fine to use. You can use elk hair if you'd like, but you can also get away with deer hair. It's a little easier to find. And you can find it in some different colors. And I'm gonna be tying in yellow today. You also are going to need some type of hackle feather. I like a grizzly. Uh, in this case, I'm using kind of like a golden or a yellow grizzly. And you're gonna need some sort of dubbing. Um, this is nice, it's a waterproof dubbing, so it doesn't absorb as much water and I'm gonna be using specifically a pale yellow dubbing out of this pack. The last piece or uh, last material that I need other than my hook, which is a size 10 dry fly hook, this is a, a gamagatsu, but you can use pretty much any type of dry fly hook. Um, again, this is size 10, but I'm also using for my thread a size 70, that's a UTC 70. Um, and you may also see it if you see it in the, the aught sizing, you might see something called six aught, and that's a, a thinner diameter thread. And we need a thinner diameter because we're using a smaller hook. Again, most of my materials here you're seeing are in yellow. That happens to be a pretty good color in my area here along the Appalachian Mountains. So like most of our flies, we're gonna start by laying a thread base. And you notice when I put my thread on, I'm going to start trapping it backwards. And by holding this thread out at an angle, it allows me to very easy, easily and very quickly lay my thread base all the way back along the hook. Now I get close to back to where I want to be. I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to cut off that uh, piece of thread. That tag end is what we call it. And so then... I can keep coming back and I'm going to go back to where the barb on the hook would be. Now I've gone ahead and pinched this barb off, but um, if you wanted to, to leave the barb on, that'd be up to you, but our tying point stays the same regardless. So at this point we're ready to start attaching our materials. So I'm going to be putting on, again, that hackle feather. Now I've pre-selected this feather. The way I found the sizing is if you take a hackle feather and you bend it around a hook shank, the individual little fibers, little barbs, will start coming loose. And you're looking for something about the length of this hook gap. You know, if it's a little short or a little long, it's fine. You don't have to worry about being perfect. And so once you find the right feather, then go ahead and start stripping a couple of these barbs back away from the shaft of this feather. And we've done this before in some of our other videos, but it's always good refresher. We trim that little end off and we come in here and we make a little comb. And what this does is it gives us a really solid tie-in point because that thread's going to get trapped in between those little barbs. And that's going to allow this feather to stay on more securely. So we're going to go ahead and bring our thread back. And we're going to leave our hackle feather just kind of laying behind the hook. We're going to attach that later. And if you got a vise like mine where I actually have a little spring I can trap it, then I can lay it, it doesn't go everywhere. But otherwise, just leave it back and it'll be fine. The next part is we have to do our dubbing. Remember, we had 
our yellow dubbing that we had talked about before. This is just a pale yellow. And I'm going to, I don't know if you saw that, I used my whip finishing tool to go into this hole and just dig a small amount out. This allows me to get smaller sections of my dubbing out of a box like this. And so now, in order to attach this, I'm going to wet my finger. Some people use wax. I find this wetting my finger works perfect. And then I can go ahead and I can put it around my thread. And the way I'm doing this is I'm just spinning my fingers together like this. And that slowly works the material into what we call a dubbing noodle. And I can work it around the thread. If you notice, there's not a ton on here. I'm going to work in small amounts. That allows me to make the body as thin or as thick as I'd like, right? So I can kind of go back over a section if I really want it to be thicker. Or in the case of this fly, I'm just going to retighten it. I'm going to do a relatively thin body. So slowly work it forward. If I notice it's starting to get a little thin, I can come back in, pull a small section out. Just wet my thread a little bit. That helps it to make it stickier. And add some more dubbing. It's so much easier to add dubbing than it is to remove dubbing. So being able to kind of control the amount that you're pulling out and putting on the thread is going to make your flies so much cleaner and so much nicer looking in the end. And so that's probably a good distance. I'm, I'm like maybe one and a half to two eye lengths back. When I say eye length, I mean the little eye of the hook here. That's going to give me plenty of room to tie in my uh, deer hair at the end. So now I can go ahead and I can take my hackle feather and start wrapping it around the hook. Now as you go through, you may notice some barbs might want to start moving forward, start getting a little scraggly. If you start noticing that, you can always take and kind of pull the little barbs back as you wrap around and that'll give a cleaner look. The fish don't care. If this is a mess, fish don't care. All it's going to do is just add to the floatability of it and really hackle imitates when uh, an insect is on the surface. It leaves little dimples and so the hackle just provides those dimples to say hey something's on the, the surface film of the water. All right, so at this point, I've got a relatively short amount of hackle left, and I need to tie it in. This is where so many times it goes wrong, where you may let this go, and it unspirals back. So I've used my hackle pliers here. Now, I could have put it on with my hackle pliers, um, but I chose to use my hands. But I'm going to put the hackle pliers on, because watch, I just let it go, and the weight of these pliers will hold that material in place. And that's going to allow me to put one behind, one in front. When I mean one behind, I mean I'm putting the thread behind the shaft of the hackle and then one in front. And what that does is creates little crosses over that material and allows that material to get trapped. So we can cut relatively close, being very careful not to cut our thread. And I always like to put another couple of wraps just to be safe. Okay, so the next part that we want to do, and this is more for aesthetics for the untie, is I'm going to take, see these are longer scissors. So I, I got a couple of scissors that you've seen me use. I've got just a pair of general purpose. These are kind of my cutting scissors. They're a little dull. They were the first scissors that I had for fly tying. And uh, as such, they're not as sharp as they once were. When you get a pair of scissors that starts wearing out, keep them around. Use that to cut your more coarse materials like bucktail and things like that that are going to wear down your nice scissors. I had a pair of very fine tip scissors 
and I use these when I really want to get in close and not cut my thread. Um, and then I have these longer ones. These longer ones are really nice when you're dealing with bigger flies, but they also work really well for what I'm about to do. I want to cut kind of a, a ramp, if you will, because I'm going to have this deer hair sticking back. And so rather than these hackle fibers sticking up, I'm going to have it so that everything lays rather nicely. So I'm just going to put the end of my scissors down on the eye of that hook and just kind of cut back at an angle. And make sure that I got all of them. Sometimes some of the ones on the sides stick out. There we go. And so now I have a good place for my deer hair to lay. So now I need to go ahead and, and grab some off the hide. And I always work front to back very evenly, allows me to get more material use out of it. And I'm gonna grab, I don't know, maybe a, a half to a third of the diameter of a pencil. Not a lot. But I always try to grab a little more than what I think I'm going to need. So I, th I think that's probably what I'm gonna start with. Trim it really close to the hide. That's just to keep that material management. And we got a whole bunch of feathers. If you see in here, you may not be able to see, I don't know if the camera's gonna pick it up, but there's a lot of little fibers. That's a little like under hair, guard hair, under fur. And all I'm doing is just working my fingers and, and getting all that stuff out. You do this because that stuff kind of acts almost, almost like a binding agent. And when we go to stack this hair, because what we want to do is we want to line all of the tips. Um, we want to try to remove all that stuff so it, it stacks real nice and clean. So now we're ready to stack the hair. Now I'm going to use a real small stacker for this. And all I'm going to do is these tips I'm going to stick them into the stacker, kind of let go, and kind of just push it down a little bit to get it started. Now, I could use a, a medium or even a large stacker, but I try to get away with using the smallest stacker that I can that still allows this hair to move because it's going to allow, I think, a, a cleaner look in the end. But you don't need to have as many stackers as I do. And so all I did was just, I tapped it down. This one's nice because it has a little soft pot or soft spot on the bottom. So it's not as loud. And then you notice here, all these tips are nice and lined up. So I'm gonna grab it right by the tips, pull them out. And again, kind of pull any of this under fur fibers out. And now I'm ready. I'm just going to transfer hands to find the right length I want. And I'm really looking for these tips to kind of be near the very end of the, the hook around the bend, or I could even go a little farther back. And so once I have that, I'm going to get rid of some of these because I have too much. So I end up with about that width. You know, maybe something that's a little bit wider than the hook gap once it's flattened out. The other thing that I want to do, I'm, I'm going to remeasure, is I'm going to come in with my scissors and I'm going to cut a slight diagonal. And this diagonal cut is going to allow me to have a really nice clean head. So now I'm going to come in at an angle so that these line up and very carefully trap these.
cut that too steep. So put it on the hook, push down a bit, come up, and just trap the butt ends. You notice how those first two wraps weren't super tight. Third wrap, and I'm pulling up. Up is the key. Don't pull down. Fourth wrap, fifth wrap, sixth wrap. Each one successfully, successive, successive, ugh. each wrap slightly tighter than the last. Now, if some of the hair starts to wrap around the side, you can always just grab it and kind of twist it a bit, or you can clean it up at the end. But now I'm ready to whip finish this fly. So we can go ahead and pull one or two more tight wraps in there so that doesn't move. Notice how I held it in position when I went to pull that thread. That keeps it from spinning. And I'll do a four turn whip finish. I've got another video showing how to use this tool. So feel free to check that out if you need to brush up on your whip finishing technique. So I can pull it and then very carefully cut my thread. Now if you'd like for aesthetics, you can come back through here and kind of take a look. And if you see any, any hairs that are just sticking out that got kind of pinched in a weird way, you can always trim those off. Fish don't see this, but you do. Um, you notice I have a couple here that have gone a little crazy, so just kind of manipulating it around that hook gives me a nice coverage, so it's going to lay flat. The other thing you can do for durability is you can put a drop of super glue right here. And if you do that, that's going to absorb into these fibers and it's going to hold that fly together even more. But that's it. That's the elk hair caddis. This, you know, in this case, tied with deer hair, uh, and is a yellow variant. But you can tie these in different sizes and in different colors. I like to tie mine very heavy, as you see. What I mean by heavy, lots of hackle fiber, lots of, you know, deer hair, or if this were elk hair. And the reason why I do that is I like to fish this through heavy riffles. Um, fast moving water up in the Appalachian Mountains for brook trout. So I want something that's going to be very high floating. And that's one thing that this fly is very good at. So hope you learned something. And if you haven't tried to tie this fly, go ahead and give it a go.